So we're partway there. We said we need two actions to take care of dealing with forms. We need to serve the form itself. We saw how to do that. We also need to get the results when the user submits the form having filled it in. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So when we receive the form, um, let's actually take a, a time to kill two birds with one stone here. And we're going to use the debugger to inspect what's coming from the user. So I'm going to go into a browser now, and I'm going to bring up that form that we just saw. I'm going to fill it in myself. I'm going to submit it. And then we're going to pause right in the action that receives the form submission and see what's going on there. OK, so here is, I'm going to start my Rails server with debugging turned on. And I've got my Rotten Potatoes homepage. I'm going to add a new movie. That was a great movie, by the way. Now, before I click Save Changes, which is actually going to submit the form, I want you to notice that over here in the Movies controller, I have stuck in the line Debugger, and it's in the Create action. The Create action is going to be the one that receives the form submission, because we already saw, based on rake routes, we can tell where this form is going to go. Let's scroll down and find it here. Here's the form. There's a bunch of other stuff that you don't need to worry about just yet, but here's the important part, right? We're going to the URI slash movies with a post method, and rake routes would tell us that where that's going is this create action right here. So let's actually see what happens when we push the button. And although nothing happens over my web browser, in my terminal window, you can see that we've dropped into the debugger. So if you've used any interactive debugger before, that's kind of where we are. And what I really want to take a look at is what's going on with this params hash, right? Params is how any parameters either entered by the user or passed in the URI are getting captured. And we can see the value of that hash here. Later in the course, we'll talk about this authenticity token. It's a way to prevent certain malicious attacks on your website. But what we're really interested in here is the value of params movie. Now remember I mentioned why would you want to name your form elements with things like movie or uh, movie bracket title, movie bracket rating, and so forth. The reason is that if you do that, the value of params bracket movie is itself a hash. Does that make sense? Because we're actually gathering together all of the form elements whose names begin with params bracket movie. The reason it's useful for it to be a hash is because you remember back when we talked about using active record to create, one way of calling the create action is to pass it a hash of the attributes of the thing you want to create. And lo and behold, what is params movie? It is exactly a hash of movie attributes for a movie that we would want to create. So this is why the Rails views work the way they do. The, those form tag helpers that we use so that we wouldn't have to generate each element manually, by default, they will generate nicely named form elements so that when they arrive in your controller method, you already are ready to essentially hand it right off to the create action. So here's where we are in the code. As soon as I continue, um, we're going to fall off the end of this method. And that's going to leave us with a little bit of a dilemma. Because remember that every controller action ultimately has to render something. And by convention over configuration, since we haven't said otherwise, it's going to look for a view template called create.html.haml, and we don't have one. There is nowhere for this action to go. So we're, I'm going to keep you in suspense, and I'm not going to continue the debugger just yet. But uh, don't, don't worry. We will come back to your debugger friends soon enough. So the important thing to notice there is that params movie is already a hash because of the way we named the form field. Conveniently, that's exactly what movie create wants to consume. So now back to this question of what happens when we fall off the end of the controller method. We're expected to render a view. So let's think about it for, from the point of view of the user. If you're about to get information about a movie, well, it's pretty clear what we should be rendering there, right? It's the actual information you asked for. But if you're trying to create a new movie, what's the appropriate thing that we should render to show you the result of what you did? We could probably show you a page that said, thanks for creating a new movie, and then you'd have to click to go somewhere else. Or given that that's mostly useless, you could just say, once it succeeds, we'll actually redirect the user to a more useful page. In other words, we'll finish the HTTP request, we'll create the movie, but we'll then immediately take you to another page that's actually useful and represents a reasonable user experience. A very common choice is if I was looking at the list of movies, I create a new movie, on success, I'll go back to the list of movies, and look, I can see the movie that I just created. So that's the way that we're going to do it. Um, and to keep in mind here, we said before that HTTP is a stateless protocol. Every request is independent. 
I've just told you that we could redirect the user. Well, that's going to trigger a whole new HTTP request. And that leaves us with a dilemma. Because we would like to tell the user something like, movie creation was successful. We want to give them some feedback about what happened. And if there's a whole new HTTP request, that means by definition we're not carrying over instance variables from the previous one. So how do we remember the fact that we need to tell the user something? And of course, because this is a common problem in SaaS applications, Rails has a way to do it. It's called the flash. It quacks like a hash. That means that you can expect it to do all the things that a normal hash would do. But it's special in that it will persist until the end of the next request, as opposed to just the end of this one. So if I finish this request, before I'm done, I put something into the flash. On the very next request, I can look into the flash and grab out that piece of information. And it will automatically be cleared out for me after that. By convention, typically we use flash notice for information and flash warning for error messages, but that's purely a convention. So putting those pieces together, what we probably want to put in here is something like this. So notice that I'm using the uh, dangerous version of create. I'm kind of crossing my fingers and hoping nothing goes wrong. That's fine for a lecture example, not so fine for your applications. This is fine for development. Don't use this in real life. But I'm going to populate this with a nice little message. And then I'll have to redirect somewhere. And where can I redirect to? Well, redirect is a whole new action, right? So let's just send the user back to the page that shows the list of all movies. That's easy enough. And I have a URI helper that I can use for that. OK, now I'm going to continue. And am I going to get an error message? Why, yes. Because by the time I made the change to my app, we had already fallen into that method with the debugger. But rest assured that if we repeat this, and by the way, this is just the error we expect, right? By default, create was going to fall off the end of the create action, and it was going to look for a template called create. And sure enough, it looked everywhere it could think of, including under the couch, and it couldn't find it, so we got a complaint. But rest assured that if we were to do this again, add a new movie, and I have no idea when this movie was released. We're still on the debugger. There. But this time, no error message because we added. What did we add? We added this flash message, which my template is set to print out. And we added a redirect that took us back to the list of movies. So this is a pretty standard idiom. When you're doing an operation that results in changing the database, instead of just displaying a passive page whose only purpose in life to say your change succeeded, is we usually acknowledge with a message like in the flash, and then send the user back to a page that's otherwise more useful. So uh, we talked about the flash. The flash is really a special case of a more general mechanism. Uh, in this case, the session mechanism, think of it as a hash that persists more or less forever. Now, there's a lot of qualifiers around forever. But basically, if I put something in the session for this user, I can expect to get it out of the session for this user during the entire time that they're continuously interacting with my app. I can reset session to nuke the whole thing. I can delete specific things out of the session that I put there. And by default, cookies store the entire contents of the session in the flash. Now, this is an important thing to realize because there's actually limits on how large a cookie is allowed to be. Right? And remember, a cookie, this is part of the HTTP protocol spec. So if a cookie is only allowed to be a certain number of characters long, and the session is just like any other Ruby hash, you can put things of arbitrary size in there, you could see where this is an accident about to happen. Right? I keep saying that. All these frameworks try to give you abstractions to help you out, but that those abstractions are leaky. They are not perfect. And this is another example of where the abstraction leaks. The session quacks like a persistent hash that's available forever. But if you put something in the session that's way too big to deserialize, there might be a problem if it overflows the size of the cookie. Now, you could be storing your sessions in the database. There's a way to do that. Um, and if you've forgotten how to use the Google, you take the important words out of the sentence and type them into Google. Um, some people with really, really big systems, uh, there's so many sessions that they use a NoSQL system like memcached to store the sessions. But really, the thing to ask yourself is, why are you putting complicated things in the session at all? If you're putting things in the session that are more than object IDs, you need to ask yourself what it is that's not restful about your application. Because if you're putting it in the session, then that must mean you're somehow relying on that to survive from one operation to another. And that might be jeopardizing trying to do a restful app. <coughs> 